Section 6. In this section of the course, we want to discuss monitoring and management, mainly focus on CloudWatch services and understanding billing. When it comes to this section, we're going to talk about native monitoring, specifically around CloudWatch and what we could do to monitor our environment. We're going to go through CloudWatch logging and then billing management as well with several demos around billing, Trusted Advisor, CloudWatch, and Cost Explorer. We have a lot to cover, so let us go ahead and get into the next part of the course here. AWS Monitoring and Management Services. This specific area is really concerned about CloudWatch. That's the native tool for monitoring, and it also, of course, has logging as part of its capability. Now, when it comes to management tools, there's, of course, any number of tools we could use to help manage our cloud resources and provide a more efficient and secure, robust cloud environment. When it comes to CloudWatch, this is mainly going to be a service we're going to use for basically monitoring via dashboard, but we could set up alerts and and also provide logging as part of the native monitoring and logging solution, which is CloudWatch. Now, CloudFormation is a tool that is used typically more as infrastructure as code. This is going to help us reduce manual errors and provide a more efficient manner for deploying resources that we would routinely deploy. AWS Billing is a service we could use, of course, to understand our billing and, and pay our invoices and understand who is spending what. could also use billing as part of setting up what's called a budget to identify cloud spending issues. Trusted Advisor has specific capabilities around monitoring and management, especially for billing. And then Cost Explorer is a tool specifically used to identify resource waste and also identify projected use as well. With that said, let's go ahead and continue on to the next part of the course. AWS CloudWatch. Let's talk about this service, which is a very powerful but also flexible solution that we really want to use to monitor our AWS environment and also, of course, log our services as well. When it comes to CloudWatch, it's, it's a monitoring service that runs on AWS and it really monitors our AWS resources and applications. Now, it's going to collect and track metrics. It'll collect and monitor log files, set up alarms and react to changes. And there's also free and paid capabilities as part of CloudWatch. Now, CloudWatch is literally a class in itself. I want to cover the, the, the use case for CloudWatch and some of the capabilities. And that's the main goal of this section. Please do consider taking the systems architect or the operations course to get a deeper dive into CloudWatch. And also, I have a monitoring course as well. Now, when it comes to CloudWatch, it's really critical to understand that we could monitor pretty much any AWS resource that we want. But on the other hand, we want to be aware that we may not need to monitor every resource and maybe we need to just focus on EC2 or EBS or RDS. It really depends on the use case. Again, one of the things about monitoring in the cloud is that the more we monitor, the greater the cost. And I've seen a lot of customers deploy CloudWatch and waste a lot of money you know, monitoring things that they probably didn't need to monitor, at least at the granularity that they did. So just, just be aware. So you can make this as detailed or flexible, as inflexible as you so choose. Now, with CloudWatch, for example, how would CloudWatch work? So here's the thing. We could set this up, for example, just as an example. Let's say I have EC2, and I want to monitor EC2, and I want to make sure that the processor, uh, the CPU utilization, 
doesn't go above 50%. And if it goes above 50%, then that means maybe I could be running into some performance concerns with my application. Maybe I need to um, deploy an instance group to solve the issue, whatever I want to set up. Again, the world is open with CloudWatch. And when I set up an alarm in CloudWatch, now an alarm is really an alert in some respects, but what I could do, but there's a difference and, and we'll cover that a little bit more uh, in another course. But basically think about an alarm as, as a way to react to an event. So we're gonna set up an alarm and then this notification I could publish, for example, to a DynamoDB topic, for example, or I could publish it to uh, a S3 bucket. Whatever I want to do, I could sort of send that out. And then I could go ahead and kick off a Lambda function to basically go out and monitor or update a table. Just one of the many things. Or I could make it as simple as kicking in um, an, an alarm to have an alert sent out to me via email. So, so with that said, there's a lot of great capabilities here. Now, CloudWatch does not monitor applications per se, and just be aware when when I say it doesn't monitor applications, it's not going to monitor like all the components of Oracle or all the components of of Kubernetes or, or whatever you may deploy. And what it does is monitor the resources that 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 application is built on. So that's really an important distinguishment. Uh, you know, again, just be aware that it can monitor your applications, for example, at a, at a simple level, but it's never going to monitor, you know, WordPress like WordPress tools can. It's really meant for AWS resources. I, I hope that's clear. Now, when it comes to monitoring resources for applications, again, it's going to monitor EC2, S3, Lambda, you name it. It'll react basically to any issues that we set up and create an event. Uh, it does not provide application discovery or provide complete, you know, visibility. In other words, we're not going to get, you know, an overall holistic view if this component has that stack layer and that has that stack layer, right? That's not, it's not meant for that. It's not going to track transactions. So if someone makes a purchase, it's not meant to track that. It doesn't provide extended analytics. However, what we can do is add additional third-party services via the marketplace and actually address some of these if we so choose. Now, some considerations. Uh, we could use third-party apps. I uh, mentioned that. Always check the partners. Uh, the partners have some great solutions in a lot of circumstances. I always encourage customers and students to, to look at what AWS partners can offer. Uh, if you're comfortable already uh, using Splunk, then do that. If you're comfortable using Palo Alto, do that, right? They, they, they already have a robust ecosystem on AWS. Now, also, just don't get confused. Again, just be aware, uh, it's going to monitor the resources, but, you know, if you want to find out who purchased what at one date, that's something you have to go into the application to look at. It uses basically event-driven monitoring, and what that means is that's going to be able to react to issues and send a notification. You could use SNS or Lambda, for example, and create what's called a pipeline. Another way to look at this is similar to like a webhook. Uh, if this happens, kick off this. We could, of course, use CloudWatch and Lambda combined. I gave you that earlier example with the three steps. Use that for trigger after an event, for example. Here's just a diagram that sort of, you know, simplifies how it could look, look at uh, that scenario. And you can see in the diagram, we have DynamoDB with Lambda. CloudWatch event has uh, kicked off. Lambda is going to go ahead and and um, react to that event. Remember, Lambda is a serverless solution that is meant to trigger based on code. And again, any number of possibilities is possible with CloudWatch. 
And lastly, we could always set up a dashboard. We could customize these dashboards. And the main use for a dashboard is to look at and monitor and manage a specific view in AWS. For example, if I want to look at only my database servers, I could create a dashboard and have an easy to reference view in, in the console. That's what dashboards do, provides us different views. Also to a good reason is compliance as well. Let's go on to the demo now and learn more about CloudWatch. In this module, let's proceed and talk about the AWS CloudWatch service and go through a demo of CloudWatch. Now, we already know from the lessons that CloudWatch is going to be a tool that is a native monitoring tool that is built into AWS. It allows you to monitor uh, metrics that you set up. They could be basically basic metrics or custom metrics. And you also can log as well as part of this uh, solution. When it comes to CloudWatch, it lets you basically keep track of performance, uh, resource usage, operational issues, etc. And it really can facilitate troubleshooting and other facets as well. Now, when it comes to monitoring resources with CloudWatch, we know that there is basic monitoring and detailed monitoring. Let's go ahead and select CloudWatch. Okay, now, now there's a lot here to cover. Uh, what I want to do is go through a uh, quick demo of how to set up an alarm, how to monitor events, and also how to uh, look at the dashboard, create a dashboard, etc. Now, when it comes to CloudWatch, uh, the first thing that you're going to see when you go to the dashboard is this basically alarm service. Because this is a new deployment, there isn't going to be any alarm set up. So what we want to do is set up an alarm later. The first thing that we want to do is go down and look at the dashboard. Now we know that basic metrics, for example, are automatically populated for us. In other words, we don't need to do anything. It's going to be populated. And you can see that these metrics here are um, basically already available in the dashboard. And one of the things to pay attention to is when we decide to monitor resources, we may have a large environment that has several different departments or many departments. They may be based in locales and different locales, whatever the situation is. We may want to create a separate view that monitors development or create another view and when i say view basically a dashboard uh, that will monitor production or test or qa and these are some things that we can consider when we deploy cloudwatch when it comes to looking at the alarms again there isn't a lot here because nothing has really been set up to set up an alarm for example let's go to ec2 first you can see when i drill down into that this gives me the metrics. Uh, there really isn't uh, anything that has exceeded any threshold, so there isn't going to really be an alarm. But what we could do is customize an alarm and then also set up an event that basically will email us or notify us in another way, like SNS, uh, that uh, there is an issue. And we could do this for any uh, major service for that matter. What I could do is go over here to create a dashboard. Now, this is the uh, default dashboard name. Now, if you see here, um, for example, uh, right here, it says CloudWatch-Default. That is your default. What we want to do now is go CloudWatch-AWS course and create a new dashboard. Now, you can see what's really nice about this is I could go ahead and tell CloudWatch, you know, I really want to look at just numbers or I want to look at line metrics or stacked areas. In other words, I could look at different types of charts. So if I select that, I could configure a line chart, for example. Then what I want to do here is set up basically um, metrics. And I'm going to call this EBS metrics. What I'm going to do now is just go over to EBS 
and select metrics that are available. The metrics available for EVS is basically going to be read-offs, write-offs, or idle time. And then again, I get to select that and create a widget. And you can see there that I have a uh, now a chart, a line chart ready to go. And then I go over here, add another widget. Maybe I want to, uh, for example, look at EC2 on this one. Select EC2. Now, remember too, when you do this, this is going to be generally catered to the resources that you're monitoring and the group that you're working for, whatever you want to do. For example, if it's development, maybe you want to monitor ECS or maybe you want to monitor uh, EC2 specific groups for, for that matter. Uh, select that appropriately. It's really easy to do. Now I'm going to call this uh, EC2. Actually, EC2. And then select uh, enter there or the check mark. What we want to do now is uh, also too, I didn't point this out the last time, but we could go here to graft metrics. If we already had um, custom metrics set up, we could go ahead and adjust that as well. In this case, nothing has been set up. Um, we could do that. Also, another thing too is, for example, we could set up an image API and actually approach it that, that way as well. So we have a lot of different options. All right, now what we want to do is select a per instance metrics. And in this case, maybe I want to just look at CPU utilization. But let's say not just CPU utilization, but maybe I'm also uh, concerned about, uh, let's see, CPU, uh, where is it, credit, credit usage. And again, you can see that I have those two items selected and the blue is CPU utilization, uh, the CPU credit usage is there. Now, we could consider when we set up this metric graph to select an EC2 instance, we may want to monitor just CPU in one and then maybe call this EC2 CPU, or maybe we want to monitor memory as well. It's really our call. Uh, and in this case, let's just say uh, commonly one of the things you want to monitor is the number of write bytes. That is a big performance indicator. So let's go ahead and select that. Now you can see that I have a chart that uh, is clearly defined. And you can see that uh, when I go over that, uh, there's actually already activity that you could already graph, which is actually nice. Now I'm going to go ahead and save this dashboard. And now the dashboard has been saved. Now let's go back to CloudWatch. Now, two things here. When I select all resources, one of the things I could also do is create a resource group. And again, there's a few things to consider um, when we do this. When I go to a resource group, let's just clarify what that is first. But basically what we could do is pull up, and this is what I was talking about before with tags, is pull up everything that we've tagged with like uh, dev or production or legal or HR or location based like Boston or whatever we want to uh, pull up or it could be SQL, whatever that group is and then pull it up based on tags. Or we could use cloud formation as well. Either way, we have a lot of power in how we could create basically a resource group. And again, pay attention to when you set this up. Okay, let me go back to, um, I just blew my setting there. Right, let's go back to CloudWatch. And now what we could do is go down to the dashboard that we want to look at. And you can see here, view the, now this is the default dashboard. And I can go over here and change this to the EC2 dashboard. And this will pull up all the metrics um, by default. Now, what I want to also pay, what I want to do also here is set up an alarm. So see that there's no alarms here. Now I go over here and um, look at a few things like overrides, live data. I could turn it on, for example. Uh, also note when you do turn on. Uh, live data that there is going to be some uh, ingress or bandwidth charges, I should say, for that. 
uh, link charts, enter full screen. There's a lot of things we could uh, uh, consider here. Now, to, to go over here to alarms, um, once we get an alarm set up, uh, for example, to do that, first of all, what we would want to do, let me go ahead and clear out. They've been making a lot of updates here, and they have all this noise like on every page lately. So let me clear that out of the way for you, and just go create an alarm. Now, to create an alarm is just a few easy steps. We're going to go select metric. And again, we're going to go select, uh, let's say in this case, um, elastic uh, beanstalk. Uh, for, and I don't know if I deployed that. So let's go to S3. I did deploy S3. Let's go ahead and look at storage metrics. And currently, um, I could select the number of objects or the bucket size in this case. So let's just say bucket size and the number of objects. And I'm going to call this S3 and just save it. Again, this is a really simple um, uh, alarm approach that we could do. And then graft metrics. And again, I could go ahead and um, select this as well. And then if I go over here, um, in this case here, actually, because this is a graft metrics, I only can select one. So I need to pay attention as well. And when you do this, just pay attention to um, the type of uh, graphs that you select, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and just select uh, one in this case and set up an alarm just for the bucket size. And you can see there that that's the graph. Again, not much activity yet. The metric name is listed here. Conditions could be static, or I could also search for anomalies. Anomalies meaning that something a little bit out of the ordinary happened, and it'll notify you. Like, for example, uh, since we... Um, in this case here, looked at bucket size, maybe the bucket sizes that were created were typically between so many megs or, or gigs. And then all of a sudden someone tries to create like, uh, you know, two terabyte size or something that's really out of average. Again, I could go ahead and select the threshold by doing that. And let me just put in extra metric here. And then go next. Then I could go ahead and select a topic, create a new topic, or use a topic ARN. Now, before you do this, when you set up an alarm, you want to, um, of course, have a topic set up. Uh, in this case, we didn't do that. I'm just going to go ahead and um, pass over that for the time being. But here is the new topic here. And I could then uh, basically use, uh, let's see, uh, what is it? help at the gcpgurus.com and then create that topic. And now there it is, it's configured. I could add a notification. Again, I already did that. And you can see there that that, uh, that is, um, actually, let me just remove that. I already configured it. Now I could go to the SNS console as well. And this is actually a very important service as well to learn. Uh, now, SNS is basically a um, subscription service that we're going to set up uh, generally. And this is a very important service in the sense that it's basically going to respond to events and it'll send an email out to that endpoint that you're going to use. So, whatever email you want to use, uh, you need to, of course, identify that ahead of time. And then I could publish a message like, uh, this is an alarm, and then time to live, uh, let's say 60, and then I could put in another uh, body to the message, for example, so up here is a topic, the subject actually, and then this is an alarm, call office, or, you know, whatever you want to put in there. And then you could put in a string, a number, a binary, whatever you feel like, and then just go ahead and uh, publish it. You know, again, this is a test and a test one. And then publish the message. That is pretty much the uh, process you want to use to set up basically uh, a CloudWatch alarm. 
let's go back to CloudWatch and uh, go to, uh, let's see here, EC2. So we've got the alarms. We want to go to uh, the cross-service dashboard. This is the EC2 dashboard here. And you can see that I could break that down as well. And then we also created an EBS dashboard. And you can see that's a little bit active now. Uh, again, um, straight enough to follow, hopefully. What's also nice, too, is I could go over here and just select, for example, different uh, time allocations and actually pull up and change the graph uh, as well. And then I go over here to auto refresh and I could select the amount of time I want to refresh. Uh, also, too, please pay attention when you um, decide on refresh. Uh, the, um, the time frame that you're selecting because there is going to be some bandwidth costs. Uh, with that said, every metric will definitely add up to your cost. So please do be aware of that. All right, now that is really all I want to cover for this course. There are other options as well, but they're in more in the advanced areas, so we'll skip over that. Let's go back to the CloudWatch dashboards here, and that's the CloudWatch uh, course there. And you can see the, the EBS and EC2 views are there, the widgets basically we created. Now, billing, uh, for example, um, one thing to realize, and this is actually pointing you out, um, that uh, you need to change regions to actually view the billing. And so you'd go up here to Northern Virginia. And again, um, that brings you back to the dashboard. And now you can see the billing uh, is loaded. Now, again, uh, not much activity we just started, but what we could do is set up an alarm for when there is a bill and then notify us when the bill is ready. Again, a lot of insight there to consider. Now, logging. Let's talk about logging. Now, with CloudWatch logging, uh, we can basically um, log uh, pretty much uh, anything that we want to log, and we could also tie it into CloudTrail as well. When we go get started, um, and again, they keep on changing this, so let's move that out of the way. We want to create a log group. Uh, that's one of the things we might want to do. And what is a log group? That's basically a group of logs for specific services that probably need to be monitored or managed together. Go over to, to Actions, Create a Log Group. I'm going to call this the uh, Demo Log Group. And uh, there it is. I create a log group. Now, what I need to do now is when I drill down, I need to uh, create what's called a log stream. Now, a log stream, when I select that, um, I'm going to go ahead and call it EC2 in this case. And when I select that log stream, well, guess what? It's actually looking um, for more information. So what do I need to do? I need to... Um, start logging. I need to turn on logging for this to start populating. And then if I go over here, you could see that um, I could change the columns as well. And then uh, if you want additional information on CloudWatch, it is there as well. For this purpose, that's pretty much uh, the main thing I want to talk about here. And when we go back here, this is Insights. What this does is it allows you to look at the ingested logs in CloudWatch. And remember from the discussions that there is no expiration unless if we set it. We need to realize that this will be saved and there is a cost to this as well. Uh, and let's say we want to look for something um, that has demo in it. And then we would run the query and then pull it up. Or let's say we set up PCI. And what we would do is tag our resources that are part of the PCI um, groups, for example, resource groups, and tag the EC2 instances, the EBS instances, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, basically, uh, you know, select them as part of the resource group and then basically pull up that information from the log. And we'd want to tag the logs as well. 
uh, in each of the services. For example, we might just add something that says PCI and then just pull everything up and that will allow us to visualize everything. Very powerful tool CloudWatch uh, is right now and it's only getting uh, more and more powerful uh, for AWS users, there's no question about it. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next module. CloudWatch logging. Let's go ahead and talk about logging with CloudWatch, specifically around the main capabilities with logging and why we want to use logging with AWS. So we know that CloudWatch is a monitoring tool we could use and not just for monitoring, but be aware that CloudWatch has a logging component as well. So this logging component we could deploy and set up, of course, any number of ways to maintain activity of who's doing what, who's launching what resources, what time, etc. With that said, logging uh, is a very straightforward use case with pretty much anything, and it's no different with AWS CloudWatch. Now, in the uh, graphic here, you could see that we have CloudWatch logging agents running on a web server, so we're going to monitor those logs with an agent. Now, there's agents that we could install on our virtual machines, for example, to grab deep insight into the activity of our processors, memory swap, etc., if we so choose. Now, with CloudWatch, we could also, of course, integrate that with CloudTrail as well. And we could also integrate it with VPC flow logs for our virtual private cloud. Just one of the many scenarios we could use. When it comes to CloudWatch, one of the things to be aware of is that we could configure AWS services as targets. And it provides us basically a near real-time stream to be able to uh, understand how that resource uh, is actually being used. Lastly, with CloudWatch, we know that there's free and paid resources available. And depending on how much logging we want to do, what the granularity is, is going to, of course, be based on what we're going to uh, deploy, but also what we deploy and, and what we use is what we're going to pay for as well. Now, again, there is free tier and free resources available, basically. But then there's also, when we uh, go over that limit, we're going to pay for additional monitoring. Also be aware, too, we're going to be using up, uh, uh, basically, API calls, bandwidth, etc. So there's a little bit more than just using CloudWatch. So we're paying for resources we use, like bandwidth. Also, too, if we're going to store the logs, maintain them, we may want to store them on S3, for example. And the more storage we use on S3, we're going to be paying more for those, that storage space because we're storing more logs. So, so again, it's not just as simple as using CloudWatch and paying for the use. It's really what other resources are we using uh, as part of our logging uh, structure. With that said, that's all that I have for logging. Please do take uh, the architect or the ops course or the monitoring course where I go into numerous demos and much deeper content in this area if that's of interest. Let us now proceed on to the next part of the course. Let's talk about billing management. One of the areas with the cloud is to always be concerned about your cloud spending. One of the biggest challenges of maintaining a efficient deployment around any cloud, whether it's AWS, Google, or Azure, is to really understand how billing is handled and how costs can be tracked. Let's talk about some of these areas. When it comes to billing management, this is an area that can be overlooked quite a bit, but the reality is that AWS has some great tools to help you identify cloud spending issues. We get set up what's called a budget, and this budget is going to allow us to say, okay, if our normal cloud spending is $10,000 a month, I'm going to set up a budget of $10,000 a month, and then have alerts set up to notify me when it exceeds, for example, 80% of the projected 
uh, amount or or actually a budget that was set. So if I have a $10,000 budget and I want it to notify me when I hit 80%, that is fairly straightforward. I could set up $8,000 as the, you know, sort of the line for where I need to send that alert and be notified. Now, if I get notified basically the last week of the month, then I'm pretty much on target. But if I get that alert, for example, the second week or the first week of the month, then that could be a problem. Also, too, it's important to realize Cost Explorer, we've talked about this several times, has some great capabilities built in um, with Cost Explorer to really identify cloud waste, over usage, give us projections of our spending, and allows us to break down by region and zone and uh, basically service uh, and, and really understand you know who who is really spending what and and that is so important in an enterprise that you know keeps on growing because there's always going to be that scenario where spending can get out of control we could also use billing alerts with cloudwatch alarms then also too we could go to billing and set up preferences on how we're going to be billed and when we could set up a budget of course to keep track of those costs as i had mentioned earlier we could set up basically um, a forecasted amount if that uh, amount gets exceeded i'll get that alert uh, basically that's called a threshold and uh, one thing to point out is that aws gives you two free budgets and then there is a cost for each addi additional budget that you set up now cost explorer allows you to estimate your cost you can generate reports and again you get to that via the cost and billing management and lastly with billing management we could set up our preferences of course as previously mentioned we could set up basically our billing alarms we could set up different reports we could also download it as a pdf as well with that said let's go to the billing and find out more about aws billing Let's now move on to the demo. In this demo, let's talk about billing in AWS. Now, when it comes to billing, of course, it's important to understand uh, how we're going to pay, uh, what we're billed for, how we're billed for, what are the formats we could use for reports, stuff like that. So let's go over to uh, billing here, and we simply type in billing. This will bring us over to the billing and cost management dashboard. Uh, being that this is a free account, there isn't going to be a whole lot of activity, but what you can do is go over here and you can see that the current month balance is zero. And this is because I'm within the free tier amount. But if I go down here, this will tell me the usage that I've used. So with the Amazon free tier you get up to 750 hours of linux uh, t2 micro instance usage i've used about 3.6 of that as far as puts i've only used one percent and then you have requests as well some other things to look at as far as alerts what you could do over here is set up a budget if you want you go over here and set up additional information who can access billing uh, over here would be where you would enter uh, basically an AWS promo code. For example, if you go to a trade show or you sign up for a demo, sometimes vendors will give you uh, AWS credits for free. Uh, and this, this is where you could uh, use those. As far as uh, invoices, you go ahead and select that. There's no invoice because uh, this is a new demo account. With that said, that's uh, pretty straightforward as far as how billing works. Then over here would be billing preferences. This is where, again, you could set up, uh, when you select this, do you want to receive a PDF by email? You could select that. You could also receive alerts. You put in your email here and then select that. Over here, you'd use the older version where you would store that in S3 bucket. And then you could go ahead and um, save that payment methods you'd enter your credit card here consolidated billing this is going to be um, uh, used for multiple 
uh, accounts, basically, but it's also been superseded by what's called an organization. That is really a high-level overview of billing. You could see here that that's the current bill, and uh, this is an account from early November. You could see I spent like $17 worth uh, back in November, and then December, no activity on the account, January, and then March. That, that again, is really um, how simple billing is. Lastly, I go over here and download a CSV if I want, and then I select download. Um, and uh, again, I have to set up my preferences first. But again, if I did set up, that would be really easy to download. With that said, that really is all to know about billing in AWS. Uh, other demos will go through Cost Explorer and budgets as well. Let's go ahead and move on to the next module. In this demo, let's talk about billing in AWS. Now, when it comes to billing, of course, it's important to understand uh, how we're going to pay, um, what we're billed for, how we're billed for, what are the formats we could use for reports, stuff like that. So let's go over to uh, billing here, and we simply type in billing. This will bring us over to the billing and cost management dashboard. Uh, being that this is a free account, there isn't going to be a whole lot of activity. But what you can do is go over here and you can see that the current month balance is zero. And this is because I'm within the free tier amount. But if I go down here, this will tell me the usage that I've used. So with the Amazon free tier, you get up to 750 hours of Linux uh, T2 micro instance usage. I've used about 3.6 of that. As far as puts, I've only used 1%. And then you have requests as well, some other things to look at. As far as alerts, what you could do over here is set up a budget if you want. You go over here and set up additional information, who can access billing. Uh, over here would be where you would enter uh, basically an AWS promo code. For example, if you go to a trade show or you sign up for a demo, sometimes vendors will give you uh, AWS credits for free. Uh, and this, this is where you could uh, use those. As far as uh, invoices, you go ahead and select that. There's no invoice because uh, this is a new demo account. With that said, that's uh, pretty straightforward as far as how billing works. Then over here would be billing preferences. This is where, again, you could set up, uh, when you select this, do you want to receive a PDF by email? You could select that. You could also receive alerts. You put in your email here and then select that. Over here, you'd use the older version where you would store that in S3 bucket, and then you could go ahead and um, save that. Payment methods, you'd enter your credit card here. Consolidated billing, this is going to be um, uh, used for multiple uh, accounts, basically, but it's also been superseded by what's called an organization. That is really a high-level overview of billing. You could see here that that's the current bill, and uh, this is an account from early November. You could see I spent like $17 worth uh, back in November, and then December, no activity on the account, January, and then March. That, that again, is really um, how simple billing is. Lastly, I go over here and download a CSV if I want, and then I select download. Um, and uh, again, I have to set up my preferences first. But again, if I did set up, that would be really easy to download. With that said, that really is all to know about billing in AWS. Uh, other demos will go through Cost Explorer and budgets as well. Let's go ahead and move on to the next module. Let's talk about Trusted Advisor. Now, Trusted Advisor uh, is a tool that's provided by AWS, and it has both free and paid uh, solutions as part of it. One of the things to uh, point out with Trusted Advisor is that it has cost optimization, it has performance, security, fault tolerance, and service limits, all part of the built-in dashboard. 
A couple other things about the uh, dashboard is we go down here and set preferences. Now we could set up permissions and also disable trusted advisor as well. We could set up notifications if we like as well. Why is this important? Well, what we could do, for example, is if we reach certain thresholds, get alerts. Um, but another thing too, this does have some redundancy uh, to some of the capabilities, for example, with CloudWatch. But if we're using Trusted Advisor and we want to get alerts uh, over cost optimization, we can do that. Um, as you see here, um, the checks here basically are dependent on your support plan. The free tier does not uh, include cost optimization. Performance is the same way. The areas that are included would be some areas of security, for example, would be included. For example, if we want to be notified about S3 permissions, we could go ahead and be notified about that. We could also be notified about security groups. For example, if we have a security group uh, that is unrestricted access, it'll let us know. So if we click on that, this tells you the criteria. And it also points out to you uh, the resources that uh, are of a concern, for example. So this will point out the security groups. And then over here, uh, IAM use. This will point out issues around that. And then do you have multi-factor authentication set up or not? If you don't, uh, then this is going to let you know that uh, that is something you might want to uh, deal with. Now, fault tolerance is also another paid feature. And then service limits. Now, service limits are going to uh, let you know when you start hitting uh, across what is called a limit. Now, a limit is also uh, similar to like a quota and some other cloud platforms, for example. So if you're starting to get close to the quota, it'll let you know um, that you're getting close. So in this case here, um, everything's good because again, uh, not much has been deployed. But let's say you deploy 100 VMs and you also deploy a lot of scaling groups. You're limited to 16 scaling groups, for example. Uh, and again, configs as well, cloud formation stacks uh, limited. And a lot of this uh, does depend, for example, on your support level. So if you have a higher support level, uh, some of these limits will actually be increased. So just be aware of that as well. That is the Trusted Advisor uh, demo, fairly straightforward. And one other thing to point out too, is we go over here and click refresh. This will refresh. So if you make any changes to your configurations, just hit refresh, it'll go ahead and update itself. Also too, if we go to the link where it looks like a download, it'll download what is essentially an Excel spreadsheet for you. And it'll go ahead and open up. And let me go ahead and bring it over into the view here. And you can see there that uh, it has it broken into uh, security groups in this case here. And then if you scroll, you can see that it has each of the checks uh, basically uh, listed. And again, this is a nice tool that you could just use immediately, put together, for example, um, to save your configuration as well. And it allows you to uh, keep track of what's going on, anything that needs to be addressed. This is nice as well, because some customers, what they'll do is just basically import this into a change request. And this is just something that uh, can save you some work. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next module. In this demo, let us proceed and use Cost Explorer and also touch on budgets and savings plans. Now, to get started with Cost Explorer, the first time you go to Cost Explorer, you will not get this menu. You'll actually get a menu that'll make you basically enable it first. You'll need to enable it. Once you enable it, it takes about 24 hours to sync up. Then after you enable it and it takes 24 hours, uh, you log back in, you should see this uh, menu here. So go ahead and launch Cost Explorer. And because this is the first time, you can see that it's still saying that uh, it's still preparing data. Now, again, 
you'll get to this point, you'll have to wait another 24 hours, and then you should be scot-free. What I wanted to show you here was about purchase savings plans. This is where you could go to get basically a reserved instance. And again, you could select these one or three year terms. This also allows you to um, select your payment options. It could be all upfront, partial upfront, or no upfront. That is called the savings plans. And then reservations. This is again a way that uh, we go and review basically um, our reservations for our EC2 instances. This again will take a little time to populate once you do that. Now budgets. Now after you enable uh, Cost Explorer, this should be available pretty much immediately. Uh, there's no budget set up. So why do we want a budget? Well, this is going to allow you to make sure that you're aware of your costs for specific services that you want to monitor. For example, the two most common expenses in a cloud environment would typically be your virtual machines and your storage and data services. Whatever that um, may be in your case could be a little different. However, just be aware that uh, you want to set up a budget to pay attention to when your costs are exceeding the threshold that you set. So if you want to limit your EC2 spending to $1,000 a month, set up a budget, make sure that uh, you set that up properly, you'll get notified, and that way you'll avoid any cost overruns that might happen. Over here, just create a budget. Let's say you want to set up a cost budget, a usage bu budget, reservation budget or savings plan budget. Generally a cost budget you're going to simply just put in a dollar amount and that's pretty much the most straightforward. Let's just say I want to say here let's say EC2 production and then the peer will be a monthly could be a recurring or an expiring uh, fixed budget. This is where we'll put in a thousand here, actually I put in 10,000, put in a thousand there, and then you just filter by the service. So over here what you'd want to do um, is go over here to filter, and then you just type in uh, over here basically the service, which I'm going to select uh, EC2, which is actually Elastic Compute, and I'm going to just apply the filters. Okay, and there I just selected Elastic Compute. And I, I of course have a lot of other options I could select. For the purpose of this demo, I just wanna show you how to set it up. Configure alerts. And now the next thing you wanna do is we're gonna, after we create the budget, we need to set up an alert. And to do that, we just simply uh, put in, basically the email contact you wanna use. And let me just do that now. And I could also add another one if I want. I'm going to leave it at that. And then here's where we want to pick, uh, for example, the notification. 80% is pretty much the, you know, what a lot of people do use. That's like the default pretty much. Basically, when it hits 80%, you'll get that email saying you reached 80% of your budget. And again, that's you know up to you to configure that. You could also configure it to a specific dollar amount as well. And then you go confirm a budget and then create the budget. And that budget has uh, been created. And it really is that simple. And then over here we have budget reports. Now this is where we would create a report basically around our budgets. Now generally, a lot of enterprises are going to probably have, you know, a, a at least one budget for each department. For example, production, development, etc. Whatever that is in your scenario, uh, you need to determine that appropriately just to be aware of costs, especially, especially if each of these departments 
or units, the business units, whatever you might call them in your, your enterprise, may have a chargeback or may have separate billing accounts uh, that they use to pay for these services. Set them up appropriately uh, if you can. With that said, that's about all I'll cover in this section. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about Trusted Advisor. Now, Trusted Advisor uh, is a tool that's provided by AWS, and it has both free and paid uh, solutions as part of it. One of the things to uh, point out with Trusted Advisor is that it has cost optimization, it has performance, security, fault tolerance, and service limits, all part of the built-in dashboard. A couple other things about the uh, dashboard is we go down here and set preferences. Now, we could set up permissions and also disable Trusted Advisor as well could set up notifications if we like as well. Why is this important? Well, what we could do, for example, is if we reach certain thresholds, get alerts. Um, but another thing too, this does have some redundancy uh, to some of the capabilities, for example, with CloudWatch. But if we're using Trusted Advisor and we want to get alerts uh, over cost optimization, we can do that. Um, as you see here, um, the checks here basically are dependent on your support plan. The free tier does not uh, include cost optimization. Performance is the same way. The areas that are included would be some areas of security, for example, would be included. For example, if we want to be notified about S3 permissions, we could go ahead and be notified about that. We could also be notified about security groups, for example, if we have a security group, uh, that is unrestricted access, it'll let us know. So if we click on that, this tells you the criteria, and it also points out to you uh, the resources that uh, are of a concern, for example. So this will point out the security groups. And then over here, uh, IAMUs. This will point out issues around that. And then do you have multi-factor authentication set up or not? If you don't, uh, then this is going to let you know that uh, that is something you might want to uh, deal with. Now, fault tolerance is also another paid feature. And then service limits. Now, service limits are going to uh, let you know when you start hitting uh, across what is called a limit. Now, a limit is also uh, similar to like a quota in some other cloud platforms, for example. So if you're starting to get close to the quota, it'll let you know um, that you're getting close. So in this case here, um, everything's good because again, uh, not much has been deployed. But let's say you deploy 100 VMs and you also deploy a lot of scaling groups. You're limited to 16 scaling groups, for example. Uh, and again, configs as well, cloud formation stacks. Uh, limited and a lot of this uh, does depend for example on your support level so if you have a higher support level uh, some of these limits will actually be increased so just be aware of that as well that is the trusted advisor uh, demo fairly straightforward and one other thing to point out too is we go over here and click refresh this will refresh so if you make any changes to your configurations just hit refresh, it'll go ahead and update itself. Also too, if we go to the link where it looks like a download, it'll download what is essentially an Excel spreadsheet for you. And it'll go ahead and open up. And let me go ahead and bring it over into the view here. And you can see there that uh, it has it broken into uh, security groups in this case here. And then if you scroll, you can see that it has each of the checks uh, basically uh, listed. And again, this is a nice tool that you could just use immediately, put together, for example, um, to save your configuration as well. And it allows you to uh, keep track of what's going on, anything that needs to be addressed. This is nice as well, because some customers, what they'll do is just basically import this into a change request. And this is just something that, uh, can save you some work. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next module. 
AWS certifications. Let's go ahead and understand the value, the salaries, and the demand for the certifications from AWS. Now, as with any certification, there's always going to be some kind of demand. It, it will certainly vary based on uh, the demand in your location. Uh, one of the things we're saying right now is, of course, because of the uh, COVID um, issues, a lot of the roles now are remote. That may or may not stay like that forever, but definitely remote roles seem to be available. So that could definitely affect your uh, salary uh, and, and also uh, job security as well. So these are things that I, I just like to point out. Uh, the, the AWS salaries range typically anywhere from, uh, and this is the U.S., of course, uh, if you go over to Glassdoor, you go to Indeed, uh, LinkedIn, they have different surveys and different information they present. But generally, um, it's typically between uh, 85K a year at the low end to the high end of about 160 a year. Typically what I see in common, uh, the average though is about 127K from what I've been seeing this year. Uh, that demand has gone down um, for for the salary ranges that are a little higher. It seems like it, it seems like companies are definitely uh, throttling back on what they're willing to pay. Uh, but that's just again could be just uh, anomalies statistically. Who knows? Uh, but I just want to point that out. Now, job security is of course going to be there if you're certified. Uh, and the reality is is that having a certification at least can can at least help get you in the door as compared to someone that doesn't have the certification. Now there's different uh, certifications of course out there. We have the foundational, the associate, the professional, and the specialty. So if you get one of these, again, it's really up to you to figure out where you want to start. You really should start at the practitioner and then move your way up one of these specific verticals um, that they have. So if you're more of an architect pre-sales, go for the architect. Uh, if you're more like the, the, the manager type, the day-to-day -day operations, cloud engineering, that's going to be more operations. And then if you're a developer, go this route. And then what you want to do is then add on to what's called a specialty cert to your base certification. Now the exams, of course, uh, are priced according to the type of exam anywhere from $100 to $300. That's all that I had. Let's go ahead and close out the course now and give you some feedback on additional resources as well. Let's now go through a topic summary review and talk about some of the areas we covered in the course as a brief summary before we close out the course. We know that Cloud computing is a model that is widely used. It is meant to deploy resources on demand. It's meant to scale out on demand. It is a model that provides us basically a way to use resources without having to put up a lot of CapEx or OpEx as well. Multi-tenancy is a resource pooling feature of cloud computing really important uh, in the sense of being able to share resources between other tenants. That's how the cloud providers really can make some money with providing these services. AWS is a cloud service from Amazon. AWS EC2 is a compute service for deploying VMs on AWS. It is a infrastructure as a service type of deployment where we're going to deploy a VM and then add our host and applications on top of EC2. Generally when we deploy EC2 we'll want to have some block storage that's going to provide us some low latency. Amazon S3 is an object storage service that is highly scalable and cost efficient. RDS is a managed relational database service that supports several database engines. For example, it'll support Oracle, it'll support Microsoft SQL, it also supports Aurora, MariaDB, MySQL, etc. 
The Elastic Load Balancer is the load balancer technology used in AWS, and it has three approaches to deploying the load balancer. We could deploy the classic, the network, or the application load balancer. When it comes to AWS security services, there's numerous benefits for using these services, such as they're automated, uh, fully managed, they're built for scale. They can also, of course, integrate with partner solutions. Uh, we could also, uh, for example, to um, extend them out to other services if we want. Amazon CloudFront is a fast content delivery network service from Amazon. It is meant to allow us to cache our services at the edge and provide for a lower latency service for our users. CloudWatch is the native monitoring service that runs on AWS. It allows us to monitor our resources and the resources as part of our application. It supports monitoring and logging effectively. Lastly, cloud spending can be managed by effectively understanding billing and management tools such as billing budgets, trusted advisor, and cost explorer. Remember, cloud spend is one of the big challenges in the cloud. We need to understand who is spending what, how they're spending it, what resources are being used, maybe which ones are not being used, and we're just paying for them. With that said, that closes out the summary. Let's go ahead now to the next module. In this demo, let us proceed and use Cost Explorer and also touch on budgets and savings plans. Now, to get started with Cost Explorer, the first time you go to Cost Explorer, you will not get this menu. You'll actually get a menu that'll make you basically enable it first. You'll need to enable it. Once you enable it, it takes about 24 hours to sync up. Then after you enable it and it takes 24 hours, uh, you log back in, you should see this uh, menu here. So go ahead and launch Cost Explorer. And because this is the first time, you can see that it's still saying that uh, it's still preparing data. Now, again, you'll get to this point, you'll have to wait another 24 hours, and then you should be scot-free. What I wanted to show you here was about purchase savings plans. This is where you could go to get basically a reserved instance. And again, you could select these one or three year terms. This also allows you to um, select your payment options. It could be all upfront, partial upfront, or no upfront. That is called the savings plans. And then reservations. This is again a way that uh, we go and review basically um, our reservations for our EC2 instances. This again will take a little time to populate once you do that. Now budgets. Now after you enable uh, Cost Explorer, this should be available pretty much immediately. Uh, there's no budget set up. So why do we want a budget? Well this is going to allow you to make sure that you're aware of your costs for specific services that you want to monitor. For example, the two most common expenses in a cloud environment would typically be your virtual machines and your storage and data services. Whatever that um, may be in your case could be a little different. However, just be aware that uh, you want to set up a budget to pay attention to when your costs are exceeding the threshold that you set. So if you want to limit your EC2 spending to $1,000 a month, set up a budget, make sure that uh, you set that up properly, you'll get notified, and that way you'll avoid any cost overruns that might happen. Over here, just create a budget. Let's say you want to set up a cost budget, a usage bu budget, reservation budget or savings plan budget. Generally a cost budget you're going to simply just put in a dollar amount and that's pretty much the most straightforward. Let's just say I want to say here let's say EC2 production. 
And then the pier will be a monthly, could be a recurring or an expiring uh, fixed budget. This is where we'll put in a thousand here. Actually, I put in ten thousand. Put in a thousand there, and then you just filter by the service. So over here, what you'd want to do um, is go over here to filter, and then you just type in uh, over here basically the service which I'm going to select uh, EC2, which is actually Elastic Compute. And I'm going to just apply the filters. Okay. And there I just selected Elastic Compute. And I, I, of course, have a lot of other options I could select. For the purpose of this demo, I just want to show you how to set it up. Configure alerts. And now the next thing you want to do is we're going to, after we create the budget, we need to set up an alert. And to do that, we just simply uh, put in basically the email contact you want to use. And let me just do that now. And I could also add another one if I want. I'm going to leave it at that. And then here's where we want to pick, uh, for example, the notification. 80% is pretty much the, you know, what a lot of people do use. That's like the default pretty much. Basically, when it hits 80%, you'll get that email saying you reached 80% of your budget. And again, that's you know up to you to configure that. You could also configure it to a specific dollar amount as well. And then you go confirm a budget and then create the budget. And that budget has uh, been created. And it really is that simple. And then over here, we have budget reports. Now, this is where we would create a report basically around our budgets. Now, generally, a lot of enterprises are going to probably have, you know, a, a at least one budget for each department. For example, production, development, etc. Whatever that is in your scenario, uh, you need to determine that appropriately just to be aware of costs, especially, especially if each of these departments or units, the business units, whatever you might call them in your, your enterprise, may have a chargeback or may have separate billing accounts uh, that they use to pay for these services. Set them up appropriately uh, if you can. With that said, that's about all I'll cover in this section. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's now go through a topic summary review and talk about some of the areas we covered in the course as a brief summary before we close out the course. We know that cloud computing is a model that is widely used. It is meant to deploy resources on demand. It's meant to scale out on demand. It is a model that provides us basically a way to use resources without having to put up a lot of capex or opex as well. Multi-tenancy is a resource pooling feature of cloud computing, really important uh, in the sense of being able to share resources between other tenants. That's how the cloud providers really can make some money with providing these services. AWS is a cloud service from Amazon. AWS EC2 is a compute service for deploying VMs on AWS. It is a infrastructure as a service type of deployment where we're going to deploy a VM and then add our host and applications on top of EC2. Generally, when we deploy EC2, we'll want to have some block storage. That's going to provide us some low latency. Amazon S3 is an object storage service that is highly scalable and cost efficient. RDS is a managed relational database service that supports several database engines. For example, it'll support Oracle. It'll support Microsoft SQL. It also supports Aurora. MariaDB, MySQL, etc. The Elastic Load Balancer is the load balancer technology used in AWS, and it has three approaches to deploying 
the load balancer. We could deploy the classic, the network, or the application load balancer. When it comes to AWS security services, there's numerous benefits for using these services, such as they're automated, uh, fully managed, they're built for scale. They can also, of course, integrate with partner solutions. Uh, we could also, uh, for example, too, um, extend them out to other services if we want. Amazon CloudFront is a fast content delivery network service from Amazon. It is meant to allow us to cache our services at the edge and provide for a lower latency service for our users. CloudWatch is the native monitoring service that runs on AWS. It allows us to monitor our resources and the resources as part of our application. It supports monitoring and logging effectively. Lastly, cloud spending can be managed by effectively understanding billing and management tools such as billing budgets, Trusted Advisor, and Cost Explorer. Remember, cloud spend is one of the big challenges in the cloud. We need to understand who is spending what, how they're spending it, what resources are being used, maybe which ones are not being used, and we're just paying for them. With that said, that closes out the summary. Let's go ahead now to the next module. Course Closeout and Additional Resources. Thank you for joining this course. Let's go ahead and do a quick review of additional resources and provide you some additional thoughts on the course and how to get certified and other areas that you may want to consider through your journey of learning AWS. One of the things we should always do is consider certification. Uh, again, we talked about that earlier. Always consider some of those courses because they're going to cover all the important points uh, that you'd really need to know about the service. Quick Labs. Now, Quick Labs is an online uh, website that uh, is focused on providing you step-by-step -step labs in AWS, but also it supports Google Cloud. Uh, and it's meant to provide uh, users an option to where they really want to learn how to deploy services and there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it and you get a, a temporary uh, credentialed account in AWS so you don't have to like use your own account uh, to prepare um, for certification exams for example or just to learn specific services. So take a look at quicklabs.com and see if that's of interest. Always review the AWS document library. AWS also has free training modules available. Always consider reviewing those. And then also look at any events that are available, whether online or in person as well. Now, as far as Tech Commanders goes, uh, there's courses available on different AWS subjects. I encourage you to look at the library and see what is available on the platform that you're using um, right now. And when it comes to certification information, uh, there's plenty of free information on some of my websites called GCP Gurus, techcommanders.com. I also have a YouTube channel where I provide free tutorials and tech tips as well. So I encourage you to go ahead and look at that as well. Feel free to contact me on LinkedIn, YouTube, Steam it, techcommanders.com. My information is there. Once again, thank you so much for taking the course. I wish you very much success in your career.